In this video, I'm going to be wrapping up our Squat Up series talking about how when we stand together, we can face whatever struggles and fears may come our way. Let's get into it. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking a lot about how important it is for a squad to stick together. But that's never been more true than when life gets a little chaotic. And it does sometimes. Have you ever gone ice skating or roller skating or rollerblading? Sometimes life can feel as out of control as you probably felt the first time you put on a pair of skates. It feels like gravity is against you. If you've never skated before, here's a tip. If you start to fall, don't try to hold your friend's hand. It might seem like a good idea, but it's not. One person is in the groove of skating along while the other is pulling you both down. Not only is it an uncomfortable situation, but everyone nearby is watching you struggle together. In our friendships, we tend to stand or fall together, sometimes literally. And I think whether you were roller skating, sledding, or just walking down a flight of stairs, we all have a story of when a friend tripped us up. Other people can trip us up too, which is fine when the results are funny and maybe only a little bit painful, but sometimes people can trip us up in more important ways and destructive ways like when we are influenced to make poor decisions, or we adopt someone else's negative attitudes or perspectives, or sometimes we even change our beliefs or values to imitate someone else. Sometimes people can trip us up, but sometimes we can trip others up too. Because we're all imperfect people, our relationships with each other can feel like a losing war with gravity. We pull each other down or let ourselves be pulled down instead of helping each other stay standing. It's a part of life. But what if it wasn't? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could trust the people around you to have your back, look out for your best interests, and intervene when you're in trouble, and they could trust you to do the same? That's the kind of squad we've been talking about for the past four weeks. There are so many reasons why we need people to have our back. Like, sometimes we just do something dangerous or unwise. Sometimes we're just struggling or hurting and we just feel alone and sometimes we're questioning what we believe, and that's where the family of God comes in. During my last year of college, I started to really struggle and question my future working in youth ministry. And as I continued to struggle with that question of, am I really meant to be doing this? I began to feel like the only person at my school who was starting to question that future. It seemed like everyone around me had it all figured out. And there I was, just a few months from graduating, fearing that I had just wasted the last four years on something that I was going to fail at. But as I continued to feel that way, I started talking with some of my friends who ended up saying that they were feeling the same thing in their different fields that they were working in, fearing for the future and what it meant. And in that, we all began to see that we were together in that. We began to encourage each other, reaffirming our strengths and our callings to what we were doing and standing with each other as we faced those fears. Jesus' followers aren't perfect, and God's family often has a lot of issues to work out. But I wanted to share that story because we need to be reminded that how the church can function when it's at its best. Today, we'll be finishing our look at the book of Ephesians and our conversation about how God's family is supposed to work when it's at its best. But first, I want to do a quick recap. Remember when we talked about the church? We're not talking about a building or an event. We're talking about the people all over the world who follow Jesus. And of course, this book called Ephesians that we're reading was originally a letter written by a man named Paul who wanted to help early Jesus followers figure out how to be God's family, both in how they're related to God and how they're related to each other. This letter was written to a whole community of people. It was meant to be read together and discussed, just like we've been doing. Today, we're going to look at chapter 6, where Paul had one final word for the Jesus followers in Ephesus. Here, he reminded them that if they were going to stand strong in their faith, they were going to need some protection. Paul described this protection in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. He said, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. 
Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Paul talked a lot about protection from our enemy, but what do we need protection from? How does our enemy attack us? We mentioned some of those ways earlier. We might need protection from doing something dangerous, destructive, or just unwise. We might need protection from experiencing hopelessness, fear, or loneliness, or losing or walking away from our faith in Jesus. In the Roman world of the first century, which was when Paul was writing this letter, Rome had conquered most of the world. So there were Roman soldiers everywhere. And since they were the invaders for the most part and the conquerors, most people didn't particularly like them. And for early Christians, Roman soldiers were disliked for even more reasons. The Roman government was, were the people that had played the biggest role in Jesus' crucifixion. They were the ones that crucified him. The Roman soldiers were actively imprisoning, threatening, harming, and even killing followers of Jesus. With that in mind, Paul did something interesting. He used the imagery of Roman armor, an image early Christians would have associated with the enemy, to tell the church they needed some armor of their own. But it wasn't the kind of armor they might have expected. Here are the pieces of armor that Paul tells us to wear. First is the belt of truth. It's a reminder to keep God's truth close where we can always reach it. The belt is the part of the armor that holds the other pieces of armor in place. God's truth can protect us. Next up, we have the breastplate of righteousness. Hopefully this is getting on camera. It's a reminder that Jesus to follow the words of Jesus, not just in our words, but in our actions. When we choose what's wrong instead of right, we leave ourselves vulnerable to serious damage. But we can also be protected by choosing to act righteously and receiving God's gift of righteousness through Jesus. Next up are the shoes of peace that remind us that we always need to be ready to share the good news of Jesus, that we can all know Jesus through Jesus' death and resurrection. Up next is the shield, which keeps us protected from lies that try to tell us Jesus isn't who he says he is, or that he won't do what he says he will. Sometimes we can believe lies that are told not only about God, but about ourselves. Maybe someone's words or actions have turned into messages you continue to replay in your mind about your identity, your worth, or your purpose. But because you have the shield of faith, you no longer have to believe those lies about yourself. Next up is the helmet of righteousness, which is a reminder that our thoughts can be one of the greatest battlegrounds. But God has already won that battle for us. Because salvation comes through Jesus, we can believe and trust that our battle against sin has already been won even when we're struggling to stand strong. And finally, is the sword of the Spirit. I know this is a noodle, but just picture it as a sword, which is the word of God. In an actual life or death situation where early Christians were being imprisoned and murdered by their enemies, I think it's kind of interesting that Paul says that their greatest weapon is the word of God. Not a sword, not a hammer, the word of God. No matter what attacks we face, Paul tells us we can protect ourselves by holding tight to everything that God has said and that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us. Paul told us to put on every piece of armor. Maybe that's because he knew we would tend to ignore or toss them aside. Imagine what would happen if we were all in a battle, but some of us had forgotten some or all of our armor. Even the best trained armies wouldn't survive very long without protection. If you're running around with just a belt and a helmet, and I'm next to you with only my sword and my shoes, we don't stand a chance. If we're going to stand strong, we need all of our armor. There's something else I want to point out. In all of that list of armor, Paul didn't ever list anything that armors our backs. Maybe that's because we were never meant to go into battle alone. Paul writes in verses 18 through 20, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Paul asks his fellow Jesus followers to pray for him. 
He knew he needed his squad. And remember, this isn't a letter written to just one person. It's written to a whole group of people. None of Paul's instructions can be fully put into practice without a community. Paul is calling us to stand strong in our faith. And if we want to stand strong in our faith, no matter what our enemy throws at us, we can stand together. I don't know the details of every battle currently being fought. I don't know what kinds of battles we will face this year, and I don't know what you're dealing with right now. But no matter what challenges come our way, I believe we can face them together because that's what God's family does. If you're fighting a battle you're not sure you can win, share it. We can hold you up and guard your back. If you think you've already lost whatever battle you've been fighting, don't give up yet. Remember, Jesus has already won your battles for you. And if you see someone else in God's family fighting a battle, you know what to do. Have their back. Here are three ways that we can stand strong together. First up, put on your armor. Don't toss it aside. Don't forget about it. Suit up every day in God's protection. You're not the only one at risk if you don't. We all are. We need each other. And don't be afraid to ask for help if you're struggling to get that armor on. Help someone else with their armor. If you see someone else on the battlefield who seems to have forgotten a piece of their armor, help them out. And finally, pray. Like Paul asked the Ephesians to do, pray for each other. A prayerless life is a powerless life, and we're called to live a life fueled by God's power. You don't have to pray long, but don't go without praying. Sometimes we'll all face battles that seem overwhelming or even impossible, but no matter what kind of battle you face, I hope you remember this. You don't have to fight your battles alone, and someone needs you to fight alongside them. Jesus has already won the war, and we're on the winning side. Because of what God has done to rescue and equip us, we can stand strong together. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this community that you've given us, that not only are we meant to love each other and love those around us, but we are meant to stand strong together when we face hardships, when we face doubts, when we face struggles, when we face everything that we face. I pray that you would help us to remember all of the pieces of our armor that you provided for us, and that you would give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear places where we've missed it or where, where our brothers and sisters have missed it so that we can show them that and get them fully armored so that we can fully have each other's backs. I, I pray that in all of these battles we'll be reminded that you have already won and that we are on your team. And I pray that you would be with us as we continue in these fights, in these battles for our hearts and our minds. And I pray that you would be with us in all of that. Amen.